On April the 28th, 1996, a 28-year-old man named Martin Bryant drove his yellow Volvo to a popular tourist spot in Port Arthur in the far southeast of Australia, a historic jail on the island state of Tasmania, and opened fire with a semi-automatic weapon. Before the day was through, he had killed 35 people and wounded 18 others. Twelve of those deaths came at the Broad Arrow Cafe, where Bryant first ate lunch and then sprayed bullets with his Colt AR-15 SP-1, which he hid in a tennis bag. At the gift shop next door, he murdered eight more people. Later, he shot a young mother running away with her two children. He was a loner with a clean-shaven face and wavy blonde hair. His IQ was very low, but he had with him powerful military-style weapons that could shoot more than one bullet per second. In a crowded area, he did not need to do anything but pull the trigger to kill many people in seconds. Just like the USA, Australia was watching mass murder at the hands of one crazed person. But there is a remarkable twist to this history. In the weeks after the Port Arthur Massacre, Australian lawmakers did something about it. Within just weeks of the tragedy, elected officials in each of Australia's six states and two mainland territories, pressed forward by police chiefs across the continent and the then newly elected Prime Minister, banned semi-automatic and other military-style weapons across the country. The Federal Government of Australia prohibited their import and lawmakers introduced a generous nationwide buyback program funded with a Medicare tax to encourage Australians to freely give up their assault-style weapons. Amazingly, many of them did. A land of pioneers and outback settlers, Australia had never embraced much government regulation and certainly not about their guns. This was a land of almost cartoonish toughness and self-reliance, home of Crocodile Dundee and Australian rules football. But Port Arthur had followed too many prior deadly shooting sprees and Australians were clearly tired of them. So what happened after the assault weapon ban? Well, this is the other amazing part of the story. Nothing. Nothing, that is, in a good way. Australian independence didn't end. Australians still hunted and explored and surfed to their heart's content. Their economy didn't crash. Invaders never arrived. Violence, in many forms, went down across the country, not up. Somehow, lawmakers on either side of the gun debate managed to get along and legislate. As for mass killings, there were no more. Not one in the past 22 years. In 2002, a mentally impaired student at Monash University in Melbourne shot two people dead and injured five others. He came to his rampage with six handguns, not an assault rifle. Had he been carrying an AR-15, the toll would have been far worse. But even so, Australian lawmakers added a new national handgun agreement, a separate buyback act, and reformulated gun trafficking policy in their legislative arsenal. There has been no similar shooting spree since. But it wasn't just the murderous rampages that faded away. Gun violence in general declined over the following two decades to a nearly unimaginable degree. In 2014, the latest year of which final statistics are available, Australia's murder rate fell to less than one killing per 100,000 people. A murder rate one-fifth the size of America's. Just 32 of those homicides in a nation of 24 million people were committed by guns. By comparison, more than 500 people were shot dead last year in the city of Chicago alone. Chicago has about 2.7 million residents. Perhaps most remarkable is the suicides by guns dropped by around 80%, according to one analysis. What stopped many of those would-be suicides was the lack of access to a gun, a generally immediate and effective method of killing. Nine out of ten suicide attempts with a firearm result in death. 
a far higher share than attempts by other methods. Public health experts call such an effect means restriction. Some Australians found other ways to take their own lives, but for many, the acute moment of sadness and resolve passed in the absence of a gun. Suicide is commonly an impulsive act by a vulnerable individual, explained E. Michael Lewicki and Sarah A. Miller in the American Journal of Public Health. The impulsivity of suicide provides opportunities to reduce the risk of suicide by restricting access to lethal means. Which brings us back to the here and now. In 2015, an unthinkable 22,103 Americans shot themselves to death with a gun, accounting for just over half of the suicides in the country that year. It isn't hard to imagine what would happen without all those guns at the ready. In a world of raging hypotheticals, we actually have some good, hard answers for all this. All we have to do is look down under. There are millions of American families begging us to do it. I'm Ray Cushett.